Welcome back to The Theology of the Buddy, a podcast for Catholics who love the beauty of the Church's sacred tradition. This is episode 63. My name is Chris, and I'm joined by my faithful co-hosts, Mike and Brooke. If you are someone who is looking to grow in their faith in new ways, looking to network with other faithful Catholics who are committed to helping you grow closer to our blessed Lord, or simply looking for other Catholic voices who are willing to speak the truth without compromise, you've come to the right place. We're not experts, but we have learned a lot collectively over the 15 plus years that we've been friends in the faith, and we want to share those treasures with you. So if you haven't yet, make sure that you hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to ensure you get the best Catholic candid conversations delivered to you every week. While you're at it, don't forget to follow us on social media so you can keep up to date with all the great content we're sending out. All right. So on today's podcast, we are returning to our series that we began in season two called the liturgical breakdown, and we're getting into the topic of the creed or the credo. So I'm really looking forward to it. We've been, we've taken a hiatus. We talked about how in the last liturgical breakdown, how we were essentially putting down the maniple as is done in the traditional Latin mass and (laughs) having that pause, hitting that pause button. And now we're essentially picking that maniple back up and continuing the journey through this uh, liturgical breakdown series. So yeah, I'm stoked. How are you guys doing? Great. How are you doing, Brooke? Good. How are you? Great. How are you, Brooke? (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm better. I'm better now that I'm listening to you guys chat and got all my handy dandy, all about the mass books by my side. Glad a little, little drinky drink little bit of tea it's all i want we brought out the uh, bishop sheen book i don't know if we use that on a lot of the past episodes i have so yeah you yeah. used it for some of your research earlier right yep yeah. it has a nice old book smell and pictures of a venerable vault machine in it so he actually had a really good commentary on the creed yeah and when i read that book i can't help but like read it at talking speed and hear his voice in my head. It's just like (laughs) the Sheen voice is so distinctive. Yeah. I was actually just watching him the other night on, uh, on EWTN and uh, I was sitting there and I had my son, John sitting on my knee and he was, John was just laser focused on Sheen. Yeah. It was amazing. I was like, yeah, boy. Yeah, boy, starting you early. (laughs) Soon he'll be pretending to uh, swing a thurible around the house, just like Vincent. Mm. They can do it together. I feel like your son might have a call to become an Eastern Catholic because he definitely waves a thurible to the level of an Eastern Catholic. (laughs) I mean, we have gone to the Ukrainian Eastern Rite a bunch of times recently because of COVID stuff. And uh, yeah. He's really focused on that thurible because the bells, right? Yeah. yeah. The bells demand the kids' attention. It's just like, whoa, what's that? But and they yeah. swing them around like crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But when when we were at um like TLM last Sunday and the altar server came by with the thurible, Vincent was just like, he was focused on it there too. <laughs> and he doesn't have obviously he doesn't have a toy thurible. So he uses a flashlight like on a on a string. And that's what he swings around. And I swear, when um, they were blessing the offerings um, at Mass on Sunday, he was just like, flashlight. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Um, Just for context for our listeners, Vincent is how old? Two years old. Yeah. 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 he, He does a really obnoxious, like, <laughs> While swinging the flashlight, he just processes around the house doing a a chant. It's okay. so yeah. funny. That's amazing. And like, you have to explain it to people too, because they're just like, "What is wrong? <laughs> it's wrong with your kid." <laughs> I love it. That's I wonderful. really, really do. 
That's wonderful. Yeah, he's a, he's he's a beautiful soul. I love Vincent. He's great. Um, so yeah, getting getting into it, we're we're talking about the creed today, and it's it's kind of an interesting thing because here in Ontario and in, and in Canada in general, in the Novus Ordo world, they do the Apostles' Creed. If you cross over the border, it's the Nicene Creed in the United States, right? Yeah. And I think that's just a matter of custom, right? Or how far they're willing to push the ambiguous language of the missile, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so maybe let's let's start out with the the creed. What is it? Yeah. Symbol of faith, right? So Monsignor Mormon talks about how the creed in the very early days of Christianity was basically how you could tell someone was a real Christian, even in like times of persecution, they would ask each other for the, the symbol of faith. And if someone would recite the creed, then you would know they were Christian. This kind of carried on with later creeds too, right? That's in the earliest days, it was the Apostles Creed. But then after the Arian heresy, of course, you have the Nicene Creed and um, Athanasian Creed. Later on in church history, you have the Tridentine Creed. And I think there are some other minor ones, but those are the big ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of a part of the Mass, it's essentially the conclusion of the Mass of the Catechumens. And it's essentially after the uh, the lesson, the gospel, and the sermon, um, the entire people assent to the teaching of the church and declare their faith with uh, the creed. Yeah. Um, Dom Garger writes that the creed, it says here, since their faith is based upon the Holy Gospel, the credo comes immediately after the sacred text has been read. Right. It says it is but right that the faithful should utter this profession of faith against the heresies that have uh, that have been broached. So because, yeah, I, maybe we can backtrack really quick. So in in the homily, right, at least in the Tridentine or the traditional Latin mass understanding, the homily is kind of like a pause. Right. It's not it's not really part of the mass which is symbolized by like I said the dropping of the maniple onto the onto the uh the missile and then picked up at the creed but in the novus ordo it's it's continued through like the the they don't really make that distinction between you know the mass and the homily it's like it's considered part of the mass itself and that's why one of the reasons why is they say that priests in the Novus Ordo shouldn't begin their their homilies with the sign of the cross because it's not part of the mass. It's the, the doing that action is not a liturgical a formal liturgical action required by the germ. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, I literally just scrolled up and noticed this because I hadn't ever noticed this in the germ before but if you go to the homily it begins by saying the homily is part of the liturgy which it's not in the traditional latin mass it's not part of the mass not that we are to exclude it right it's to be included yes. but it's not part of the the action of the liturgy why because and and I think the traditional Latin mass in her um in her postures makes this clear when you're talking to God, you're facing him, right mm -hmm. um and then when you are talking to the people, you face the people, right but I mean, what's the difference? I go from my altar where I'm performing, I mean, celebrating for everyone to see and looking at them right in the face uh, through their masks, of course. And then I just sidestep over to the ambo, which I, which they call the altar of the word and 
continue the action there. It's another manifestation, I think, of the loss of the focus on the sacrificial character of the mass, right? Um, the overemphasis on the teaching and community aspects, right? Absolutely. More Absolutely. of, you know, the Protestant influence, right? Where their mm-hmm. church or their church service is only about teaching scripture and being in community, right? No sacrifice. So, yeah, there's a, so many little indications of that loss of focus. And this is definitely one of them. Yeah. So within the the rules of the recitation of the creed in the traditional Latin mass, it says here that the credo is to be said not only on all Sundays, but moreover on the feasts of the apostles who preached the faith, on the feasts of the doctors who defended it, on the feast of St. Mary Magdalene, who was the first to believe the resurrection, announced it to the apostles, and thus became an apostle to the apostles. I love that. On the feast of the holy angels, because allusion is made to them in these words, quote, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. On the feast of the blessed virgin, because the credo also speaks of Our Lady, but it is omitted in voted, votive masses. It is said also on the feast of the dedication of a church and on patronal feasts, because it is supposed that on both the, those days, there will be a large concourse of people. And it is on that account that it is to be said on the feast of St. John the Baptist, should it fall on a Sunday, for otherwise it is not said, because St. John came before the mysteries were accomplished, and because there is no mention made of him in the symbol. The credo is said likewise, when a church possesses a large or important relic of the saint whose feast occurs, and on which it is taken for granted, many faithful will assist at the services. So, end quote. That's from Don Gershay. So, that's kind of the rules for the Tridentine side. What's the rules for the Novus Ordo? Cool. Here's the uh, the rules from the Novus Ordo. Get a drink because it's going to be pretty long. Um, the creed is said on Sundays and solemnities. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, because it's the Novus Ordo, we have to add a... Uh, another little bit after that says you can actually do whatever you want. So it says it may be said also at particular celebrations of a more solemn character. Yeah. Just option. I enough to let you do it anytime you want. Yeah. This is kind of, I kind of chuckle reading this part. If it is sung, it is begun by the priest or if this is appropriate by cantor or by the choir. It is sung, however, either by all together or by the people alternating with the choir. If not sung, it is to be recited by all, all together or by two parts of the assembly responding one to the other. I'm just going to sigh. It's, the alternating part, I don't understand. Well, I mean, I guess you can see kind of like saying the office or something. Oh, like in parts. Maybe. I guess so. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It is yeah. kind of funny how so many places in the germ, it'll be like, this is what you should do. But also, if it's appropriate, you could do this, 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 or this. That's my point. And there's no <laughs> yeah. criteria. So you can just decide to do any of them anytime. Yeah. So just, just in case uh, for any new people listening in. So the germ stands for the general instruction of the Roman Missal. And it's the the guiding document uh, from the Vatican with regards to how the liturgy is to be celebrated in the ordinary form or the mass of Paul the sixth. So, um, mm-hmm. so another, another point, just kind of taking a jab at Canadian saying the apostles creed. So it says here, the symbol it's from, again, from Dom Garage. I love him. He says the symbol recited during the mass 
is not that of the Apostles, not the Apostles' Creed. It is that of Nicaea. Or if we would speak with full precision, we should call it the symbol of Nicaea and Constantinople, inasmuch as the entire article referring to the Holy Ghost was added in the First Council of Constantinople against Macedonius. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, in... Uh the general instruction, it's kind of funny. It doesn't specify exactly what creed to use. It just says the creed. And where it quotes from it, it quotes from the Nicene Creed. But I believe in the Missal, it has that note that says, particularly in Advent or Lent, the Apostles' Creed may be used instead. And I believe it recommends it on the basis of those being special times of baptism where the apostles creed is used yeah so that's kind of where the uh the common practice of always using the apostles creed came in because the language is just vague enough to let you get away with it and it's a little bit shorter so people like it mm -hmm. it says here speaking about the the length the nicene symbol i like calling it that i'm gonna start calling it that the Nicene symbol is longer than that of the apostles, which nevertheless contains all the truths of faith, but as heresies have gradually sprung up, it was found necessary to give further development to such of the articles as were attacked, and thus the several heresies were pointedly condemned, each one as it appeared. This symbol contains everything that we have to believe, for we say in one of the articles, I believe the church and hence by believing all that the holy church believes we possess everything that she has adopted and everything she has declared to be truth in the councils of nicaea and constantinople as also in all the others which followed yeah absolutely we were just reading the uh tridentine creed earlier before we started recording and i think it was an updated version even including uh some Vatican one related content, but, uh, it's a really beautiful creed too. If you want to use it in like private prayer or something, I highly recommend reading it. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's basically what Nicaea did for the Arians. The Tridentine creed does for Protestantism and to some extent modernism too. It explicitly calls out, a ton of errors, like, you know, there being seven sacraments and not, sorry, that's a truth, not an error, but yeah, <laughs> it calls out the fact that there are seven sacraments and that there's no salvation outside the church and that purgatory exists and that we can pray for our souls in purgatory and things like that. It's beautiful. Yeah. I always presumed upon the idea that the creed was said everywhere during the liturgy all the time since you know since the time of the apostles and that was just it according to dom garger he says listen to this until the 11th century the credo was not thus publicly said in the churches at rome saint henry emperor of germany when visiting Rome, was surprised at not hearing the credo during the Mass. He spoke on the subject to the then reigning pontiff, Benedict VIII. The pontiff told him that the church at Rome gave in this an indication of the purity of her faith and that she had no need to express her rejection of errors, which had never been harbored within her walls. However, shortly after the emperor's remark, it was decided that the credo should be said in the churches in Rome on Sundays, for that confession of faith would become all the more solemn by its being promulgated from the very chair of St. Peter. Need eh? Yeah, I read, I read that same thing in uh, This is the Mass, and I, should, and I shared that with Mike this evening as well. That's the Fulton Sheen book. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it said here, um, this is a footnote that he had. It is usual to ascribe this adoption to the instance of the Emperor Henry II, who came to Rome in the days of Benedict VIII. Berno, abbot of 
I'm terrible at French, at French. Rationale states that when the emperor asked the Romans why they did not recite the creed at mass after the gospel, he met the reply that inasmuch as the church of Rome had never been tainted by heresy, they had no need to recite the creed. And when I heard that. I was just like, huh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's actually um, an important event relating to some of the politics around the schism to yeah. the adoption of the creed at mass in Rome. Mm hmm because um, local churches all around the world had started saying the creed during their liturgies. Like, I think Sheen noted that the first places to do it were actually Antioch and Constantinople, and then later it was adopted in the West. Mm -hmm. um, but the West had started saying the filioque, and uh, <laughs> it really wasn't well known, apparently, in the East. This is something... Uh, Dr. Alan Finister talked about on uh, in the history of the church councils, how in the East, it wasn't well known that um, the filioque was said in the West. And uh, it only kind of became known to them after the church at Rome started saying it during the mass. And that was when, because it wasn't well understood, it was kind of seized upon as a political tool to say, hey, the Pope's a heretic. He added this filioque to the creed. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, this is a, a bit of a sidetrack. Obviously, it didn't wasn't something that arrived arose from scholars or from, you know, pious Eastern Christians at first. It was something that came first from like an emperor who wanted an excuse to call the Pope a heretic. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the filioque, Dom Gergé makes mention of that as well. So, for again, for those who are listening and may not know, so the filioque, what is it, Mike? If you could give it a succinct definition. Um, so it translates usually in English to "and the sun." Well, the meaning is usually more through the sun, I guess, if you want to get into how it's understood. But um, this is something that was added by converts from Arianism, I believe. So after converting back to Catholicism from being Arians, they wanted to emphasize even more strongly that the Son is actually God. And so in this part about um, the Holy Spirit, they added that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. And that became a common practice through all the the West. But uh, yeah, because of translation issues, it didn't translate well into Greek and became misunderstood. And that kind of led to this, led to it being a political weapon against the Pope and was a big part of the uh, rhetoric around the schism. Right, right. It says here from Dom Gergé that it was actually in Spain that the addition of the filioque was first of all introduced into the creed. Interesting. Um, in order to express with greater precision what the fathers of Constantinople had declared, this change was begun in the 8th century, but the Roman church did not ad adopt it till the 11th. Yeah, it says here that the church knew that such a measure would provoke difficulties, but seeing the necessity she decided upon it, and since then, this addition to the symbol has become obligatory on the whole church. So, yeah, I think as of, I mean, Orthodox people might contest this, but I think at least since the Council of Florence, the uh, translation issues and the actual meaning of it has been pretty much ironed out to the fact, to the point that at Florence, all the Eastern bishops agreed to the filioque and being fine. Right. But then again, there were political issues and the Pope ended up excommunicating the emperor or something like that after Florence and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. Right. Right. So it, it caused problems, but in my opinion, anyway, the problems weren't really due to the filioque. It was more of a scapegoat issue. Interesting. Interesting. So why is it important for us every Sunday, at least, to say the creed. 
What's the big deal? So this is from um, the Latin Mass Explained Mormon. He says, after the gospel, the profession of faith follows. The priest returns to the center of the altar and he stretches out and elevates his hands, turns his eyes towards heaven and says the prayer, which begins with the word credo, I believe. This is the answer of the church to the gospel t- teaching. She replies that she believes all whatsoever Christ taught. The credo is an abridgment of the Christian doctrine and is often called the symbol of faith. So it's like it ties everything in together. Like we've been given, we've been given the gospel and then we've been given this profession of our faith. Like it sums up that we all have to profess together before we, you know, witness the Holy sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's something to be said as like everybody professing the same thing. Again, reinforcing that, that universal belief, that universal truth. Yeah. Do you have a moment in your lives where you can recall suddenly the shift happening in your head and in your heart and you start saying the creed with complete conviction and you're like, I'm meaning every word I say here. Like, do you, like for me, I know like after I had my conversion, like I was going to church all the time and like, but it was just road prayers or whatever. But suddenly like when you start knowing that like, this is the real deal, you start saying the creed, not like, uh, just like a, just something that you just spout off, but you, you say it with conviction and, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, especially at Easter, like being able to, you know, declare the creed is such a big deal. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, do you guys like, do you find that you get excited just saying the creed sometimes? I know I do. (laughs) Um, I can't say that I can recall, like, you know, exactly when that started, where there was that, I don't know. I don't know how to word it. Excitement when I was saying the creed, but I do remember like during our wedding, that was a big deal for us to have people see like, you know, a, as well done as, as possible Novus Ordo mass with as much reverence as we could possibly ask, ask for, I guess. Is at that the, the right word? We didn't go to the, yeah. At mass. the time we didn't go, but there was something about standing in front of everyone, you know, during our, you know, our marriage and saying the creed. And I think that was important. It's just one that I remember. <laughs> I don't remember that. What happened that day? <laughs> I'll tell you when you're older. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the creed. I just, particularly that I, day. I just remember the schnitzel. That's all I remember. It was so good. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. German club schnitzel. Uh, for the Shout reception, to the Schwaben Club in Kitchener. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I do remember that being really important. And yeah, it, the one thing it brought to mind for me was this is back in the life teen days. I this was kind of like when I was going through that transition of taking things more and more seriously you know i had recently like gone back to confession and like actually started to believe stuff i remember starting to note in my head to like stand up straight almost like i was like um standing at attention like a soldier or something <laughs> during the creed I, that was something i i uh always used to think about and mass back then mm-hmm. yeah. whenever I uh, said the creed. Even yeah. now when we say the, when we sing the creed at mass, because you know, you, a, you have to sing it while well, we're singing it at mass. Um, but there's an involvement when we kneel down at the moment where we say, uh, and he became. Et incarnatus est. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking today while we were preparing for this, about the Magi that first got to see baby Jesus and how, you know, they would have knelt down to venerate him and and worship him. And we do the same thing 
you know, when we recite the creed, there you go. Yeah. And that's one thing that's, that's been removed in the Novus Ordo. Is you, they the, bow, is it's, they, it's, I think they're encouraged to bow their heads at the, yeah, they at kind the of brought that back in the new translation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see it in practice at the Novus Ordo? I don't. In practice, no. But I definitely saw it in the, uh, like the pew cards and stuff. Yeah, and it's on we the definitely cards. were making an effort to do it when we were still going to the Nova Sordo. Yeah, I, I was being obnoxious with it back then. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> my head was like literally on the next pew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a bit of a Pharisee that way. But like, honestly, like <laughs> I was just like, why is nobody bowing? Yeah. Like, I remember one of my one of my um, uh, cousins spoke about the because she she's an apostate she's left the faith and like she complained that we knelt at during the creed she's like why are we doing this you know and we're like this is what we've always done as catholics like mm -hmm. is she at the latin mass or no actually it was at a it was at a novus ordo christmas eve mass oh. yeah. and they actually had everybody kneel at the in at Incarnatus Est. So yeah. Interesting. I mean it, it's yeah. just I just find it cool that they actually tried to do that. Supposedly it didn't go over very well. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I mean it's I again I just love how much the the Tridentine mass in particular loves the creed. I mean, we have mm -hmm. so many um, mass settings for it. You know, the there's you know all kinds of different polyphonies and stuff that have been written for it. We love the faith, and these very words are the things that people have died for, shed their blood mm -hmm. for. You know, yeah. And so, you know, whether you're in the Novus Ordo world, whether you're in the traditional Latin Mass or in the Eastern Rite, or any of the other rites of the Church. If if you find that you've kind of that you kind of glaze over when you're saying the creed, renew, renew that love yeah. for it because you know there's going to come a time, and I think it's already here that those words are going to cost us, and um, mm -hmm. and if we don't if we don't say every every mean every word we say, if we don't mean mm -hmm. it, we'll give it up. Well, wasn't it in in the previous? episode where you said um like god would ask where do you stand mm -hmm. yeah yeah adam like, where do you stand right in the book yeah. of genesis yeah. yeah there's something to be said about you know thinking about the creed as you know if somebody had a gun to your head and said you know what do you believe that's what you should be saying mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'm preferably a chant <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say bang. But it's like it's so dark. It's morbid, but it could happen. Yeah. It could happen. Yeah. Well, do you guys know? I was listening to the story just you know earlier this week about the the martyrs of Compiègne, the uh, the Carmelite the Carmelite martyrs of Compiègne. Yes. I mean, what a story, <laughs> right? I mean, they were alive during the, the days of the French Revolution, and uh, the revolutionaries at that time were trying to destroy the church. They were taking the nuns and, and the monks, throwing them out of convents, destroying their convents, setting them on fire, setting churches on fire, killing priests, doing whatever. And these Carmelite sisters had been forced into a secular life, forced out of their convent. And then they were accused of a false crime, brought before a court and accused and sentenced to death. And on the day of their execution, somehow all of their clothes magically were in the wash and couldn't be worn. So they all had to wear their habits mm -hmm. and uh, they ended up going to the, the town square center of the town square where there was the, the guillotine and each one, as they approached, like they were all there, they began singing. There's, there's different, uh, different stories. Some say it's the, the Vene Creator Spiritus. Some say it's the, um, the Salve Regina, but 
in either case, all the nuns were singing this hymn and they one by one would approach mother superior, ask for her permission to go and die. She would give them permission. They would go up again. The, the singing continued, the ax would fall and they'd continue singing. And one by one, the song starts getting quieter and quieter and quieter until complete silence. And, you know, obviously mother had to go as the last one to die. And, you know, normally the like things like that, that would happen executions would, there'd be all this pomp and circumstance with it. There'd be a drum roll, you know, and then the ax would fall and everybody would cheer. Yay. It was dead silent in that crowd and they just mm -hmm. dispersed and 10 days later the revolution fell so yeah anyway i mean i i love that story but i mean i think yeah the words of the creed matter and we should especially in these days be singing and saying it with utter conviction every mass mm -hmm. and when we're praying our rosaries saying the apostles creed with conviction you know because again if we're if we lose that conviction those words will just become like any other and and we won't be willing to die for them so and if you and if mm -hmm. you struggle with that ask god for the zeal for the faith for the zeal of the confessors so yeah anyway that's that's my ted talk thanks for coming <laughs> thanks for listening to my podcast <laughs> that an episode yeah for sure any any other final thoughts before we we close no i think that was good no i can't follow that no can't well friends again uh thank you to everyone for listening today we are so glad that you're back and hanging out with us we see all the downloads and whatnot and uh, we do we do really appreciate it um, so again, if you aren't subscribed to us, if you've just found us while scrolling through, you know, Spotify or Apple podcasts, give us a little subscribe. We'd love it. We'd really appreciate it. If you want to follow us on social media, we'd love that too. You can find us at theology, the buddy pretty much everywhere. Um, also, uh, you know, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to throw us a review. Yeah, it just it would mean the world to us to to know your thoughts. And uh yeah. Next week we are having the ladies do a takeover. What do you think about hair them flip apples? Right there. You can't see it, but hair flip. Nice. Nice. <laughs> what 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 can they look forward to, Brooke? Uh See, we're trying to figure that out. Julie and I have this very special connection where, you know, we just know what the other is thinking just by making looks and stuff. Um, but that doesn't translate very well in audio form. So, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking we need to talk about uh, trad wife stereotypes, but... Ooh. It's, it's, it's so spicy. <laughs> Julie's going to be yelling at the mic. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I have a lot to say. First of all, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about it. I'm not quite sure yet. What do you guys think? What do you want us to talk about? I'm looking at you, Mike. What do you want us to talk about? Trad wife stereotypes. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Trad wife stereotypes. That's coming out next week. You're not going to want to miss it. Tell all your girlfriends. They are going to love it. Have them subscribe. Share it with your family. Mention us at Thanksgiving if you're Canadian. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> Side note, I looked at Mike and I was just like, you know, what? is there like a trad man stereotype? Yes. There definitely is. Because get this i was i was describing all of these things that i would consider like a trad man you know trad man stereotypes and i just basically ended up describing dr taylor marshall <laughs> he's a real chad he's a chad yeah mm -hmm. it's just like you know it's true though <laughs> yeah, yeah there's a lot of them 
wears suits, smokes pipes, has a beard, shoots guns. <laughs> White guy. wife stays at home, bears the the anyway. The wife's the type. Yeah, but like to I think there is a to be a trad man, you have to be married. Oh, true. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a symbiotic relationship. Unless you're a priest. Yes. Got to have a bad wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. All right, guys. Well, okay. thanks so much for listening, everyone. We appreciate it. We'll see you next week. And uh, until then, from all of us to all of you, stay, stay tratty. tratty.